So <coughs> welcome to the Scottish Economic Society Economic Policy Lecture for 2023. We're delighted uh, that Silvana Tenrero is uh, giving the lecture this year. Uh, Silvana, as you know, is Professor uh, in Economics at the London School of Economics, having obtained an MA and PhD uh, from Harvard University. Uh, Silvana has received uh, much recognition for her work and received many prizes. She's a fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Econometric Society. She's a former president of the European Economic Association uh, and for her work on monetary policy and macroeconomics, she's the recipient of the 2021 Uriah Janssen Award and the 2022, that's quite a lot of 20s, 2022 Birgit Grodel Award uh, and many others. She's been a, a co-director uh, and board member of the Review of Economic Studies uh, and chair of the Women's uh, Committee of the Royal Economic Society. And of course, Silvana uh, has been a, uh, on the Bank's, Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee uh, since the 5th of July 2017 and is due to step down on the 4th of July of this year. So back in the early days of the MPC, external members uh, finishing their period of service often didn't have much to report or, or many beans to spill. Uh, well, I'm sure Sylvana won't be spilling any beans today, but her tour of duty has been uh, much more eventful uh, than those earlier days. And uh, I think the topic of our lecture uh, speaks to that. So Sylvana will speak for about 50 or so minutes and then we'll try and uh, fit in a few questions. So Sylvana, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to give the 2023 Scottish Economic Society Economic Policy Lecture. Thank you very much, Charles, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to speak at the Scottish Economic Society annual conference, and it's certainly appropriate to be in Glasgow this year, marking the 300 years since the birth of Adam Smith. Over the past year, the MPC's decisions on bank rate have rightly been the main focus of public discussions on monetary policy. That should be no surprise. After more than a decade below 1%, the MPC has taken bank rate from just above zero up to four and a quarter percent in little more than a year. And these changes have large direct impacts on borrowers and savers across the country. It's also the level of bank rate and expectations of its future path that will determine where inflation will fall back to over the next two to three years. In the written version of this speech I'm giving today, I discuss in more detail past decisions on bank rate. But for the rest of the talk today, I will discuss another policy tool, quantitative easing, or QE, and its reversal, quantitative tightening, QT. QT and QE have very much been in the background in terms of news reports and also by design in my own policy decisions over the past few years. My talk will set out why QE and QT in the UK context need not, and indeed in my view should not, be part of our month-to-month -month thinking on monetary policy. I will also try to dispel some of the many myths and misunderstandings that have developed over QE since its inception. Although it's currently in the background, it has attracted a lot of attention at different times. It was a topic of a recent inquiry by the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee and a current inquiry by the Treasury Select Committee. It has also been heavily discussed and analyzed by bank policymakers and researchers with about 100 different publications materially related to QE since 2009, averaging uh, one every two months. Um, despite this wealth of discussion and, and analysis, a key finding of a recent independent evaluation office assessment of QE was that the tool was poorly understood by the public and for some contentious. In my view, these two assessments are closely related. Any controversies stem in large part from misunderstandings about QE. In the words of Ken Rogoff, QE is surrounded by hocus pocus and confusion about the channels through which it operates. <laughs> 
Some of this was probably inevitable for a tool about which policymakers and experts learned as they went, and there's no settled consensus. Uh, today I will seek to take stock on what we have learned as we gather, gathered evidence over time. Um, at the same time, many long-standing misconceptions could perhaps have been avoided if, as suggested by the Independent Evaluation Office report, QE was framed as a change in an interest rate rather than the creation of a quantity of money. Increases or decreases in the quantity of reserves are a byproduct of QE and QT, just as they are for a range of other central bank operations. But in a system where the bank pays interest on reserves, and where reserves are one of many liquid assets held by commercial banks, the quantity of reserves is completely incidental to how the policy works, its aims, or its success. Despite this, the framing that money was being created or printed probably fed into some of the most pernicious myths about QE, including that it was in some way a transfer of wealth to banks. Instead, we should think of QE as a tool which, just like changes in bank rate, can potentially, under circumstances that I will discuss, affect longer-term interest rates. This could happen through different channels, possibly involving the reduction of liquidity premia through a liquidity or market functioning channel, term premia through a portfolio balance channel, or expected future short rates through a signaling channel. Thinking about QE in this way leads me to the four points um, which I will spell out in more detail in the rest of my speech. I think I... There's some extra icon there that uh, I'm not sure I can close. Um, let me see. Oh, it's froze. There we are. Um, so here are my four key points. First, QE is an asset swap. It does not create new private sector assets, which is how some may understand money printing descriptions nor does it involve spending money in the, sense of, in, in the sense that fiscal policy does. No private sector banks, firms, households, or governments end up with higher net worth from QE transactions themselves. Second, QE affects the economy only to the extent that it affects interest rates. There's no separate money channel that can unleash inflation. In crisis time, at times, QE can be powerful as it can prevent increases in spreads via liquidity or market functioning channels. And preventing an unwarranted tightening in monetary conditions can be crucial to avoid undershooting the inflation target. But outside crisis episodes, I judge that the effects on yields and therefore on the economy are likely to be small and temporary. This means that attempting to come up with fixed bank rate equivalents or headroom in billions can lead us astray. Effects and headroom depend on the yield impact, which is smaller outside crisis. Now, irrespective of its precise effects on interest rates, the MPC has not used QT, quantitative tightening, as an active tightening tool. Since bank rate is being used to influence shorter and longer term interest rates at the moment, uh, which can we can freely observe, then the pace and size of the QE and QT programs need not have any effects on the total amount of policy tightening or the policy stance, and I'll come back to these points. So let me start with the first point, QE as an, as an asset swap. Uh, at a high level, QE aims to affect interest rates using central bank purchases of government bonds or debt held by the private sector and financed by issuing central bank reserves. Reserves are part of a central bank's base money, but for the public sector as a whole, the government and the central bank together, they are just one type of zero maturity liability. <laughs> 
So QE effectively involves swapping one type of public sector debt for another, changing its composition, but not the total amount. For the private sector, reserves are deposit accounts at the central bank, used by commercial banks to settle payments between each other. This position as the ultimate settlement asset makes them the most liquid asset in the economy. In the past, many central banks did not pay interest on reserves. And in some jurisdictions, and in basic textbook models still, commercial banks are subject to reserve requirements. This gives reserves a unique role in providing liquidity to the banking system and a mechanical link with the quantity of lending in the economy. If this was ever an adequate simplification of banking, it certainly is not in the UK today. The Bank of England pays interest on reserves and banks are subject to broader liquidity regulation, which also encompasses other interest-bearing liquid assets, such as short-term government bonds. In periods of acute market disruption, such as the dash for cash in March 2020, reserves and short-term government bonds can become less substitutable, and bonds become less liquid, and there is increased demand for the ultimate settlement asset. But outside of such extreme episodes, reserves and short-term government bonds are close substitutes since they have similar maturity, liquidity, and risk characteristics, and they pay a similar return uh, with interest on reserves. So for the private sector as a whole, QE involves swapping one type of liquid asset, reserves, with another, government bonds. That is why descriptions of QE as money printing fall wide off the mark. The net amount of assets and liabilities held by the private sector and held by the consolidated public sector remains unchanged. But a plain English reading of the term is suggestive of additional assets or wealth being created or being spent. This framing of the policy probably fed into several common misconceptions about QE, some of which I will now try to dispel. First, QE did not involve giving money to banks. Some banks were recapitalized by governments during the global financial crisis, but other than the fact that it was in response to the same crisis, QE was completely unrelated to that bailout. From the perspective of a commercial bank, QE either changes the composition of the balance sheet or expands it. For example, a commercial bank can sell a government bond worth £1,000 to the central bank, and it will receive £1,000 of central bank reserves in return. This is the case A in the picture. There's an asset swap involving two claims on the public sector with different maturity. Alternatively, another counterparty of the central bank might sell a bond worth £1,000 to the central bank, and deposit the £1,000 received from the central bank uh, with our commercial bank. This would be case B in the picture. In that case, the effect on the counterparty balance sheet is identical to case A with the simple asset swap. For the commercial bank, it now has a new asset, uh, £1,000 uh, reserves, but also a new liability, a £1,000 deposit. The bank's balance sheet has expanded, but there's no transfer of wealth. The net worth of the bank and the counterparty is to a first order unaffected by the QE transactions. Second point I want to make is that QE is not government financing. QE by design shortens the maturity structure of consolidated public sector debt. Following a QE program, the public sector as a whole has lent long-term uh, debt than it otherwise would have had, but more short-term debt. In principle, the Treasury could achieve much the same outcome by issuing more short-term debt and less long-term uh, debt. 
Other than this change in the maturity structure, QE does not directly change the cons consolidated public sector finances. The notion of QE as government financing may stem from the fact that asset purchases have typically taken place when the government deficit was expanding. However, the reason for that correlation is that both fiscal policy and monetary policy acted counter-cyclically, responding to the same common shock. In particular, in particular, they were both loosened in response to the global financial crisis or the COVID-19 pandemic. Monetary policymakers undertook QE in order to achieve their inflation target, not to support a fiscal expansion. Of course, counter-cyclical monetary policy, whether through bank rate or other tools, can push down on borrowing costs in times of crisis for both the public and the private sector, but as long as independent central banks are implemented QE based on their own inflation targeting remits, then this is not a form of government financing. To avoid this and other misconceptions about QE, I think that discussion of the policy should focus on its goal and on how it impacts interest rates, which is what determines how QE affects the real economy and ultimately inflation. Regarding its goal, the MPC has carried out QE exclusively to fulfill its remit. And it's precisely the goal that defines it as a monetary policy action. Regarding the impact on interest rates, there are at least three advantages to this framing uh, in preference to discussing the impact of QE as asset quantities or, or changes in asset quantities. First, survey evidence suggests that public understanding of, of interest rates is higher than it is for any other topic, which might make the policy more accessible. Second, it would make clearer that um, the similarities between QE and bank rate um, in, in this context and avoid the impression that there is an independent money channel of QE. In many of our models and in operating frameworks with, with scarce reserves, there is a duality between the quantity of reserves and the interest rate, such that changing the quantity of reserves will influence demand and inflation. But in these models and frameworks, it does so because it changes the interest rate, not through some independent mechanism. And third, because that duality breaks down, breaks down in frameworks like the one in the UK, where there is interest on reserves, um, this, this is an important distinction. In, in such a system, the quantity of reserves completely detaches from the interest rate and becomes entirely incidental to the stance of monetary policy, other than as a byproduct of QE operations. Instead, the aim of QE, as I said, is to help meet the inflation target by pushing down on longer-term interest rates through various channels. And lower long-term interest rates should simulate demand and economic activity in much the same way as conventionally rate cuts do. The key questions are how much QE purchases can push down on long-term interest rates, under what circumstances, and how persistent these effects are. Um, so the literature has focused on three channels through which QE can potentially push down on longer term, term interest rates, as outlined in this uh, chart. A market liquidity or market functioning channel, a portfolio balance channel, and a signaling channel. Liquidity means different things to different people. Uh, the notion of liquidity I refer to here is broad or systemic liquidity. Market-wide liquidity can dry up in, terms of, in times of stress, and QE can clearly have material effects on yields in such times of stress. There is ample evidence of, for a state contingent market liquidity or market functioning channel from a large number of event studies. In the UK, the first QE program in 2009 
and the fifth program in 2020 both started during periods of market turmoil and strongly pushed down on long-term yields, offsetting the initial shock. By limiting spikes in term premia dur during periods of market stress, QE can protect the monetary policy transmission mechanism and reduce the economic harm done by certain shocks, helping the MPC to achieve its inflation target. But the question is, can QE add monetary policy stimulus above and beyond offsetting a financial uh, tightening caused by an external shock? That is, can QE stimulate the economy relative to the pre-shock path? To do so, it would have to operate through either the portfolio rebalancing channel or the signaling channel. And my reading of the evidence, uh, the empirical evidence, makes me skeptical about the quantitative strength of these two channels. Uh, the immediate UK yield response to QE announcements for prices in calm markets um, was typically small, as illustrated in this chart. Some event studies find statistically significant e effects via portfolio rebalancing income market conditions, but typically the quantitative effects are very small. More important, it, these event studies cannot tell us how persistent these effects are beyond their narrow event windows. There's additional evidence from other countries such as the US and um, other jurisdictions like the Euro area, but it's difficult to read across to the UK where QE programs largely purchase safer, more liquid assets. So what I'm saying here only applies to the UK uh, context or, or purchases of government bonds. Um, there may also be some evidence for a signaling channel, but there are reasons to think that this channel should weaken over time as public understanding of the tool improves and as central bank's actions reveal that QE provides little effective commitment to any particular path for the short-term rate over and above forward guidance. So I, I will now um, go through uh, these two channels, signaling and portfolio balancing, in a bit more detail to explain why I see QE as largely working through temporary liquidity effects. The portfolio balance channel, developed and, and discussed in, in the work of Greenwood and Bayanos and Bayanos and Villa, rests on the idea of limits to arbitrage. There are preferred habitat investors, such as pension funds, that have an inelastic demand for safe assets of certain maturities. One would ordinarily expect arbitrageurs to undo any persistent effect of the, of the presence of these prefer, preferred habitat investors on uh, term premia and, and yields. But these arbitrageurs may be myopic or risk averse, or perhaps they are subject to capital or liquidity constraints, which brings us back to the broad liquidity and market function in channels I was discussing before. By reducing the free float on long-term bonds via QE, the central bank can reduce the total amount of duration risk that market participants have to bear. The limits to arbitrage theory implies that the reduction in net government bond supply at specific maturities can lead to a decrease in the real term premium at these and potentially neighboring maturities, pushing down long-term government bond yields, which can in turn stimulate economic activity. So that's the theory. The key question is whether these assumptions hold in practice, and in particular, whether they hold in a quantitatively meaningful way and outside crisis times. We have event studies that find statistically significant effects of QE announcements for prices on yields. Uh, for example, uh, Joyce et al. showed that UK government bond yields fell, from, uh, fell more than OIS rates after UK QE announcements in 2009, as illustrated in this chart, which suggests effects via term premia rather than exclusively via expected future short uh, rates. But the key limitation of event studies is that they can only identify effects in a narrow time window. 
That means that event studies cannot tell us whether QE effects on yields really are due to persistent falls in the term premium or whether they merely reflect um, short-term liquidity effects that die out before they can have material effects on output and inflation. A number of observations in the data suggest that portfolio balance effects on yields, if present, are only transitory and unlikely to account in a statistical sense for yields behavior since the financial crisis, the, great, the, the global financial crisis. Um, let me summarize three of uh, these observations. Uh, first, plot, plotting the yield response to QE surprises, not just on announcement days, but over a longer time window, as in this chart, the aqua line, reveals that much of the effect on yields dies out quickly. Changes in yields are only significant for a month or two. This is what this chart tries to show. Uh, the aqua line here shows the sum of uh, the cum cumulative response of the 10-year spot yield to UK QE announcements that contained a positive surprise relative to market expectations. The light and dark pink areas here show bootstrapped confidence intervals for randomly drawn start dates instead of QE announcement dates. So the overlap after 50 days tells me that the effect is likely uh, just transitory. Even these short-term effects become insignificant when excluding March 20, uh, 2009 and March 2020, the two episodes when QE operated during acute market stress. This is not a well-identified exercise, so it does not prove anything. It merely illustrates that the patterns in the data may be more consistent with a temporary liquidity effect rather than a persistent portfolio balance effect. Um, second point I want to make, in the UK, long-term interest rates did not persistently fall in the years after the first QE programs. Uh, following the global financial crisis, long-term forward rates initially remained persistently high. As it gradually became clear, clear that the recovery would be slow and the policy rate would need to stay low for a long time, long-term forward rates started to fall. The UK yield curve flattened slowly over the 2010s, most likely reflecting the evolution of expectations on the policy rate. There's no obvious relationship um, between the flattening of the yield curve and the timing of QE announcements or QE surprises, challenging the view that QE via the portfolio balance uh, channel was a key driver of lower uh, long-term rates. And the third observation here is that a naive view that after 2008, um, central banks engaged in QE and term premia fell, so QE must have caused term premia to fall. That conclusion does not follow, however. What should matter for term premia, according to the theory, according to the portfolio balance view, is the total amount of long-term government bonds that the private sector has to absorb. All is constant, QE reduced that amount, but in absolute term and relative to GDP, that amount, uh, what we call the free float, actually went up significantly after 2008. And that's because government debt increased materially at the time. The correct reduced form uh, observation is that uh, markets had to absorb a lot of additional long-term debt and yet, term premia fell, which is the precise opposite of what the portfolio balance view would predict. These are trends over a decade, so it's hard to identify causal effects, but to maintain that portfo the portfolio balance view as an explanation for persistently low long-term yields, one would have to argue that term premia would have fallen even more than they did over the past decade if the free float had remained constant. And that's an, um, an argument that is hard to make. Um, none of these three patterns I describe in the data <coughs> is conclusive proof that QE had no persistent effects on yields. 
Nevertheless, to me, the data appear more consistent with the liquidity or market functioning story. Large shocks, such as the global financial crisis, the euro area crisis or COVID, and large increases in the free float can push up term premia temporarily when arbitrageurs' capacity is temporarily constrained, and QE may have limited those spikes relative to the non-QE counterfactual. But eventually, arbitrageurs do their job, so there's no significant persistent relationship between free float and term premium. The evidence is fully consistent with the model of Vallano uh, and Villa, actually. QE effects on yields depend on the risk capacity of arbitrageurs. If that risk capacity is state dependent, QE effects will be state dependent and largest when market liquidity dries up. Theories of slow moving capital provide another avenue to model this. With slow moving capital, large changes in net bond supply can have large effects on yields until new capital flows into the affected markets to reestablish the non arbitrage condition. QE can be an important tool then to safeguard the monetary policy transmission mechanisms in, in times of stress. But QE has little effect on yields through portfolio balance channels when markets are functioning well and their effects um, become transitory, unlikely to explain the medium to long-term patterns in, in yields. So let me turn now to the signaling uh, channels. They capture two separate proposed uh, mechanisms. One is that QE purchases provide a commitment to keep rates low for longer, which helps strengthen forward guidance on rates. Another um, story is that QE can help convey news about the state of the economy or communicate the central bank's reaction function at the effective lower bank bound. The commitment-based signaling channel is expected to work like this. Suppose inflation is too low, but the central bank cannot cut the short-term interest rate because of a lower bound on interest rates. The central bank could promise to keep the policy rate low for longer, adding stimulus by pushing down expected future short rates and hence longer-term interest rates. That would be an example of forward guidance. There are, however, limits to this approach. In particular, the central bank cannot credibly commit to a timing consistent policy. Markets will anticipate that once inflation rises above target, the central bank would want to raise rates even if it had previously uh, promised otherwise. In this view of QE as a commitment device, the premise is that QE could help central banks stretch the limits of forward guidance. But the question is, why should asset purchases provide any more commitment than forward guidance? For the commitment-based signaling channel to work, undertaking QE would need to make it more costly for the central bank to raise rates quickly once inflation rises above target. This could be the case if the central bank is committed not to raise rates before finishing an announced QE program or before unwinding part of the program. However, this has not been a constraint for many central banks, certainly not for the Bank of England. And even in the case that there was a commitment not to raise rates before QE completion, it is not clear that QE really adds an additional hurdle. The same reputational damage could result from breaking forward guidance promise after all, the announced tightening sequencing itself is a form of forward guidance. Now, some have proposed a profit motivation behind the commitment. If a central bank has many long-term government bonds on its balance sheet because of QE, raising rates would generate financial losses um, on, the, on these exposures. A central bank, they argue, may then want to delay rate hikes to avoid losses and only start to raise rates after reducing these exposures through quantitative tightening. But in the UK, 
as in other countries, there are arrangements in place specifically designed to ensure that monetary policy, uh, monetary policy makers focus exclusively on the appropriate monetary policy and do not worry about the narrow financial implications of QE for the public sector. And the economic benefits of QE, of course, go well beyond any financial profit or loss from changing the maturity structure of consolidated public sector debt. In times of crisis, such as in 2009 and 2020, QE purchases were an essential part of the policy response necessary to hit the inflation target through limiting financial market dysfunction and preventing even larger recessions. These macroeconomic benefits of QE are likely to dwarf the direct fiscal implications of QE. Moreover, indirect fiscal implications of QE, such as higher tax revenues owing to shallower recessions, are likely to outweigh the direct fiscal implications of QE. Uh, the arrangements that shield central banks from the direct fiscal implications of QE are stable because they are by design optimal, both from a macroeconomic perspective and from a fiscal perspective, taking into account all these general equilibrium effects. So in my view, QE is unlikely to commit central banks to any particular path for the short-term rate, at least not any more than forward guidance could. To the extent that markets did place some weight on a commitment-based signaling channel, this weight may decline over time as understanding of QE develops and as they observe the sequence in, uh, in, in the um, current tightening. A different signaling channel um, proposed um, uh, by some authors could operate if the central bank signals news about the state of the economy or reveals its reaction function via QE. Suppose, for example, that the central bank thinks there is more spare capacity in the economy than previously thought. A normal response to that would be to cut interest rates. But suppose we are at the effective lower bound. The central bank could just say that it expects to keep rates lower for longer. But by engaging in QE, it is argued, a tool that might actively stimulate demand, the central bank's announcement could carry more weight. A precondition for this expectations channel is that QE does work through other non-signaling channels, or at least that central, uh, the central banker believes that to be the case. If QE had no material effects on yields, output, or inflation, then QE would always be costless for the policymaker and hence could not send a more credible signal than words or forward guidance about either the state of the economy or the central bank's reaction function. But if, for example, QE effects through portfolio balance channels are believed to be large, then the expectations channel could, in principle, amplify the effectiveness of QE. Overall, it is conceivable that QE could work to some extent via signaling, but these effects should be modest in size. One important exception to this may have been the first QE program, which could have pushed down the term premium significantly and permanently. That may have occurred if markets came to think um, it was more likely that central banks could step in to purchase some types of assets at times of financial stress or market dysfunction. But that would be a one-off effect which cannot be repeated. In its absence, signaling channels could be less powerful. A clear implication of the state contingent nature of QE is that it does not make sense to try to think of fixed equivalences between some quantity of QE purchases and a change in bank rate of a certain size. Small amounts of QE purchases or even just a commitment to purchase without any transactions taking place could prevent large, large rises in yields during times of stress or illiquidity but very large quantities in terms of billions of pounds could translate into limited yield movements at other times. <clears throat> in other words, QE multipliers are not a useful way to frame the effects of the policy 
They could be very large or very small, depending on conditions, on the conditions on which um, or when QE is used. Um, similarly, we should not think about QE headroom in terms of the quantity of gills available to purchase. The available headroom will depend on the prevailing level of yields and whether there are significant liquidity or market frictions that QE can help alleviate. Um, having set out my understanding of QE transmission, I will touch on how QE relates to the challenge facing monetary policy makers around the world over the past 18 months. That is, inflation rates well above our targets. Some have argued that the high inflation rates we are seeing today are to some extent, or even to a large extent, a consequence of QE. The same kind of argument was made back in 2009 when some commentators predicted that asset purchases would quickly result in very high inflation. Yet central banks around the world used QE for many years, but inflation rates remained at and in some cases stubbornly be below their targets. Um, so, so let me make a couple of observations. Uh, first, several of my colleagues and I have set out how extremely large external shocks and not domestic demand conditions have been the overwhelming cause of this period of uh, very high inflation. I discussed in a speech in November last year how the majority of above target inflation can be accounted for by the extraordinary increase in global energy prices caused by the war in Ukraine and by the increasing globally traded goods prices stemming from uh, the effects and after effects of the pandemic. My colleague Swati Dingra recently showed evidence suggesting that much of the rest of the inflation increase uh, in the CPI basket stem from the indirect effects of the shocks via the supply chain. While monetary policy can always control inflation in the medium term, much of its effects on the economy come um, with a lag, which means the short-run inflation volatility um, from, from such large shocks uh, is almost unavoidable, and, and this is recognized in our remit. Even if shocks such as the war in Ukraine were perfectly, perfectly foreseeable years in advance, there is no realistic monetary policy that could have prevented their highly inflationary impact. Mechanical uh, policy extrapolations I've done in previous presentations show that even extremely high interest rates in the middle of the pandemic would not have prevented inflation rising far above target. They would have required extremely high unemployment rates and even larger falls in real wages. And they would have led to an enormous inflation undershoot when the energy shock faded. Such a policy would not have been consistent with our remit. It would also not have been desirable or possible mid-pandemic when the furlough scheme was successfully preventing a large rise in unemployment. Second, my motivation in the second half of 2020 for extended QE purchase, uh, purchases was for it to act as an insurance in case of further episodes of market dysfunction owing to the uncertainty coming from the pandemic. Um, their impact on yields, given markets remain calm and well functioning, is likely to have been very limited. This is consistent with the evidence on the transmission mechanism I uh, just described, which suggests that QE's main effects come at times of heightened market stress. Given limited impact on yields, which were already very low, um, there was little additional demand stimulus from these QE announcements or purchases. Uh, third and most importantly, bank rate was the MPC's active tightening tool. So even if one were to, be, uh, were to believe QE has a bigger impact, bank rate was the tool we were using to influence shorter and longer term interest rates. Fewer asset purchases would not have implied less policy stimulus. They would have implied communicating or 
uh, communicating a lower path for bank rates instead, in order to avoid tighter financial conditions, given the judgment uh, of the overall stance um, that was needed. I will uh, next turn to the similar set of arguments that apply to QT today and explain why I think it can operate in the background with no impact on month-to-month -month policy decisions. Um, so in February 2022, the MPC began stopping the reinvestment of maturing guilds, and since, no since November 2022, it has voted to actively sell bonds. But just as with QE purchases made over 2021, the pace and size of the QT program need have no effect on the overall degree of monetary tightening and therefore on the outlook for inflation. Although the MPC is unwinding QE, it is not using the stock of asset holdings as an active monetary policy tool. It has made clear over a number of years that once bank rate was away from the lower bound and could move in both directions, it intended to unwind the stock of QE gradually and predictably, and in a way that was not bound to underlying economic conditions. Instead, bank rate is the active instrument today, and it is observed interest rates and asset prices that feed into our forecasts, which will automatically incorporate any effects of QT. Hence, whenever asset prices move persistently in a way that makes financial conditions too loose or too tight to meet the inflation target, whether caused by QT or anything else, then our forecast will reflect this. Our decisions and plans on bank rate, which are informed by our forecast, will adjust in order to offset those moves. Moreover, the program of asset sales is designed in a way that it should have a minimal impact on asset prices. QT has been undertaken so as not to disrupt stable market functioning. This approach means that asset sales should have no material effects on yields through liquidity channels. At the same time, undertaking QT gradually and predictably in the background should detach it from the active monetary policy debate. That implies that QT should not have any material effect through signaling channels. That leaves the portfolio balance channel, which I argue had only small and temporary effects on yields in well-functioning markets. I expect the same to apply in the case of QT. The critical point for setting monetary policy in real time is whether QT effects are large or small, uh, but as I said, they need not impact the overall policy stance. Bank rate will be in charge of determining that stance. Um, I will pause here, Charles, and uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Um, so let me just uh, go back to my uh, four main points. Thank you. Perfect timing, thank you. Okay.